Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is the algebraic bargaining model of war. Now, this is the first subsection of chapter two of my new book, The Rationality of War. You can find a free PDF of that by clicking on the video description. In the video description, we'll also have links to purchase the book on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So that's shameless self-promotion aside. The big question for today is still, can war be mutually beneficial? We're trying to show that war can't actually be mutually beneficial. We saw some intuition in the last video about Venezuela versus Colombia. What we want to do in this video is sort of expand that intuition and show that this intuition holds for a general case and not just the specific case when we were talking about Venezuela and Colombia. So the model looks like this. There are going to be two states. We're just going to label them A and B. They're going to bargain over an object worth one. Now this one just means 100% of the good. In the last video, when it was Venezuela versus Colombia, that one represents 100% of $80 billion worth of oil, but it could also be 16 square miles of land or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just 100% of the good. And the object is infinitely divisible, which means the sides can come to an arrangement on any division of 100%. So it could be that they, the sides will split it 50-50. It could be one will get two thirds and the other will get one third. It could be that one gets 0.111 and the other one gets 0.889. I hope I did my math correct there off the top of my head. But yeah, it doesn't matter as long as the object is infinitely divisible. That's what we're caring about. That's the assumption that we're making so far. Okay. Now, if the states were to fight a war, then P of A is going to represent the probability that A wins a war, and PB is representing the probability that B wins a war. We're going to, by assumption, assume that there are no draws, so that the probability that A wins plus the probability that B wins sums to 1. Now we can relax this, this assumption about no draws and still get the same result, but it will make the algebra a lot more messy, and so I'm not going to do that here because it's just basically redundant, and everything that I'm going to say holds if we allow for draws as well. We're just not going to do that particular case. So it's either A is winning the war or B is winning the war, no draws. But if the states fight a war, they're going to pay costs, and the costs are going to be represented by CA and CB, and those costs have to be greater than zero. So there's some substantive loss that the states incur by fighting. Now, these costs reflect two things. They reflect the absolute costs of war. That's like how many people would die if you fight, how many buildings will be destroyed, how much money you're going to have to spend on your military. But it also incorporates something that we call resolve or how much states care about the issue. So, for example, if Mexico and the United States were bargaining over Minnesota, the United States would be willing to pay a lot more costs absolute costs than Mexico would be to, to maintain control of Minnesota because Mexico just doesn't care about Minnesota. So for Mexico here, if we were talking about Minnesota being the object that we're bargaining over, if we were to fight a war in that case, Mexico's costs would be really, really large in comparison to the United States's costs for fighting over Minnesota because the United States cares a lot more about the issues. It's willing to put up a lot more in costs to save whatever's at stake than Mexico is here. And so these costs reflect both the absolute costs and the resolve. And these costs can also take any functional form as long as they are positive. So we might imagine that a state that is very likely to win the war will be pay paying very small costs in expectation, while states that are very likely to lose the war are going to pay much higher costs in expectation. That's fine. We're not going to define that in any way. We don't need to define that in any way. All we need is for these costs to be greater than zero. So we're not going to have any sort of functional form here. We're going to leave it as generic as possible because we want to keep this as general as possible. And then the ultimate question that we're interested in answering here is, is bargaining always an effective means of resolving the dispute? And the answer is going to be yes. So let's look at A's peace constraint here. Let X be A's share of the bargain settlement. Then A is satisfied if X is greater than or equal to the probability of war, or probability of victory in war, times what you get if you win, that's all of the good, which is worth one, minus the costs of fighting for A, which is C of A. And so you can just get rid of that one, and you have X is greater than or equal to PA minus CA. So that's how much A needs to get in a bargain settlement to be happy with that bargain settlement and not want to fight. Now, on the other hand, B's peace constraint looks like this. So X is what A gets in a bargain settlement. That means B gets the rest. The sum of everything in this bargained world is 1, right? So that means B gets 1 minus X. That's the remainder of A's share. So it's whatever A doesn't get, B gets. And so B is satisfied by getting this 1 minus X value. If 1 minus X is greater than or equal to the probability of B winning the war and getting everything, that's PB times 1 
minus the cost of war CB. And so you can do a little bit of rearranging here. First of all, that one's going to go away. And so you just get one minus X is greater than or equal to PB minus CB. And then solving for X, you get X is less than or equal to one minus PB plus CB. So that means because X is how much A gets in a bargain resolution, that means that A cannot receive more than one minus PB plus CB. Otherwise, there won't be enough left to appease B as well. So that's B's war, or B's peace constraint. Now the question is, is peace possible? Well, A is satisfied if X is greater than or equal to PA minus CA. B is satisfied if X is less than or equal to one minus PB plus CB. We can string these inequalities together and say that an X is mutually satisfactory if PA minus CA is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to one minus PB plus CB. Now, the question is, does such an X exist? Well, an X will exist as long as there's space in between PA minus CA and one minus PB plus CB. So as long as PA minus CA is less than or equal to one minus PB plus CB, then we can find a, a value for X that satisfies both of those constraints. We can find a mutually satisfactory X as long as that inequality holds. Now, at first glance, you might think that we're stuck here and we can't really get any further, but actually we can, and here's why. Remember that we said that there are no draws in this world, and again, that doesn't really matter for the general proof, but for what we're doing right here, this is a really neat shortcut we can use. Remember that PA plus CB equals 1. I should say PA plus PB equals 1 which is what you see on your screen right there. And so if we solve for PB, we get PB is equal to one minus PA. And now we can substitute in one minus PA for PB into that original inequality, and we get that. And now we can do some simplifying here. So we get, after the first step, after we distribute that negative and get rid of the one, we get PA minus CA has to be less than or equal to PA plus CB. And then getting rid of the PAs and moving the negative CA to the other side, you get CA plus CB is greater than or equal to zero. So an X, a mutually satisfactory X exists if the costs for A plus the costs for B are greater than or equal to zero. But remember that the costs of war for each state are positive. So that means CA is positive and CB is positive. And when you add two positive numbers together, you still get a positive number, which means that inequality has to hold which means such an X exists, so there are mutually satisfactory bargained resolutions that both states prefer to fighting a war. So the conclusion is that peace is possible. Now, the drawback of this algebraic model is that there's basically no way of interpreting this result. We spent the, next, the last five minutes or so just looking at, at variables and inequalities, and we don't really have much intuition about what's going on. And so we need to resolve that because we want to be able to get a clear, concise view of the war uh, of the world and war in our heads. And the best way we're going to be able to do that is in the next video when we talk about the geometric model. So in the next video, we're actually going to plot these values on a number line and we'll see what's going on in this in this world of bargaining and why bargaining is so much better than war. And we'll do that in the next video. So I hope you join me then and I'll see you next time. Take care.